Hello, Melissa. How are you? Hi, how are you? I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing great. So I'll just cut to the chase. You have a new single out that has been quickly climbing up the charts. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Oh, my goodness. Footprints of an Angel. Yeah. Um, well, I was asked to do a movie uh, right before the pandemic. And um, I said yes, and I went in and did the movie. I played the mother of a, a young lady who has um, two kids. And she was out in the street doing her thing and, you know, and doing the wrong things. And then she cleaned up her act and she came back home to us. And uh, when she came home, we found out she had cancer. And um, I play her mother and uh, I have to sing at my own daughter's funeral. When I finished the, the scene, I talked to the director and the writer, and I said, you need a theme song for this. And uh, they told me to go home and write it. And uh, all weekend long, I listened to The Temptations and David Ruffin and all those good people. And uh, I was like, if I could do a, a female David Ruffin something in 20." 20 at that time 2021 it'd be fabulous you know because so many people you know in this in this generation don't know about him so um i had that in mind when i was writing and then right after watching documentaries on him uh marvin gay and Terry terrell came on with ain't nothing like the real thing <laughs> and i was like if i could get the beginning of that and sing it like a female David Ruffin, we might have something. And then you have Footprints of an Angel. Yeah, and it's doing really well. We just got added to a Sirius XM Praise, Kirk Franklin's uh, channel. So we're very happy about that. And uh, like you said, it's moving up the charts and, and we're just so happy everyone is embracing it and loving it. And the message is, uh, it's about, remembering and, and, and honoring the loved ones that we lost. So how does it feel to, after all of these years, um, for the people to know that the people still love what you have to offer? Because I, I think your last I checked on the charts last week, you were top 10. So and you might be number one now, but how does that feel? It feels good to give them something that they want to hear from me, because that's the thing with the legends, you know, like me and Patty or Gladys or, you know, Mickey or any of us is that uh, we can do a whole bunch of things. But if it's not what what they want to hear, they'll kick it to the side. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my last, my last uh, um, CD that I released in 2018, uh, they kind of kicked it to the side. It was like, what? They liked all the cover songs that I did, but they didn't like embrace the, the new stuff. So it feels really good that this song, they're embracing and going, okay, that's our beliefs. Okay, okay. We're we coming along the journey with you on this one. We like it. So it, it feels good. <laughs> So speaking of that journey, I want to go back just a little bit on yours. So can you just talk a little about your beginning and how you learned and figured out that you had a voice? My mom, yeah, in, in the living room uh, with my sister uh, in Corona, New York, at probably about eight years old, seven, eight years old, singing in the living room. Uh, um, R E S V E C T. Find out what it means to me. R E S V E C T. Take care, T B C. That's what I used to say, T B C. Because I didn't know what it was. And seven and eight. Take care, T B C. <laughs> I don't know if you know about like house parties and stuff like that, but back in the day when we were growing up, my family had what they call a round robin house party. One, one weekend it would be at our house, the next weekend it would be at my Aunt Lena's house, the next weekend it would be at my auntie's house. I mean, they just went on, uh, on my cousins too, they just went around each other's houses and, and just had house parties, you know, to keep the family together. And uh, my mother would be like, okay, you girls practice the song. And then when they come over, I 
my house, you know what I'm saying? You'll get to perform. And if you do well, I'll take you to Showtime at the Apollo, you know what I'm saying, for amateur night, you know what I'm saying? So uh, we would practice and wear our mother's clothes and shoes and, and sing, and uh, uh, they loved it. And my sister, she loved it a little bit, but then she went into it, but I just kept singing. So my mom took me to, uh, it was an audition uh, for a uh, gospel choir, the Solids of Corona, which was like two blocks away from where we live. And every Saturday, they said, you, you practice every Saturday, and then on Sunday, you would go to church, and they would go to different churches. And my mother really took me there to get me out of the house on Saturdays. But uh, it turned out to be the best thing for me because Honrad Washington, uh, became my mentor and the person who taught me how to sing and deliver a song. And something a lot of people don't know about you is that you've been in the business since you were, is it like 15 or 16? Because I was recently listening to a recording. Um, who was it with? Business Before Pleasure, Prime of Love. Was that your first recording? Yeah, that was, that was like... Um, uh, 15, I graduated in high school at 16 and I went out on the road with them and we had did that two years before. So that's like 14 years old. Yeah. Um, I went to audition uh, for a group. It, it, I, I kept singing. I was doing talent shows in school and, and just all kinds of things and, and singing it with the gospel choir and uh, singing at birthday parties, anywhere that I could sing, I was singing. And someone told me, they said, oh, there's a group called Business Before Pleasure that's looking for a singer. And uh, I went and audition because I was, uh, you know, I was 14. You know, everybody thought I was 16. I, was, I looked older for my age, you know what I'm saying? What can I say? <laughs> so um, I went and I auditioned and they loved the way I sang. And then when they found out that I was 14, it was like, oh my God, we don't know. Because, you know, they did bars and clubs and stuff like that. And uh, I was like, my dad, my dad, will, my dad will approve of me to be in your band. He'll he'll come and sit at that at the at the shows. And it was like, well, if you don't sit at the shows, then and they, they met my dad and, and my dad said, okay, and, and he would come and sit at the shows. Yeah, in, in the bars, because they had to be 18 and older. <laughs> to be in there but you know my dad would sit there doing the doing the show we would do the show and he'd take me home yeah <laughs> and then we signed with sylvia robinson which was sugar hill records and uh we did a song called prime of love and uh I, I don't know if Sylvia got into hip hop. It was more money. And she was into her stuff too. Remember Sylvia Robinson? Ay, yay, yay, Hello, I love you, Sylvia. Rest in peace. But yeah, she did that song, which was a huge hit. So Sylvia was into herself. And then Sugar Hill came along and they was huge. And, you know, they just kind of kicked business before pleasure to the curb. But uh, I was able to tour Canada with them, which was nice. So, and how did you go from business before pleasure to high fashion? When I, when I finished tour with uh, business, because, you know, I graduated now when I was 16. I went out on tour with them, you know, for about eight months in Canada. We did all parts of Canada, Saskatchewan, Vancouver. Oh, my God. Yeah, Cal Calvary. We did everywhere. So, um, after that, I came home. I started doing sessions. My first session was with Debbie Allen. Debbie Allen from um, Fame, yeah, and Broadway. And her husband, they wanted to do, they were looking to, you know, find a, a new artist, but nothing really never came up. But I got to record with them. And then from recording with them, they told somebody else about me. And then I started recording with Jocelyn Brown and, and singing background with Melba Moore and uh, this one and that one. And then Whitney Houston, I met Kashif and sang, you know, on her, her record. And, um, you know, that's kind of like how that came about. In high fashion was uh, Pinterest. He was just signing um, musicians in New York, good musicians in New York. And he was signing them and they were doing uh, records like Change was Luther Vandross and Timmy Allen and Fonzie Thornton and all these people that were 
uh, like the number one session singers at that time. And they got Allison and, and the other gentleman, I keep forgetting his name all the time. And um, uh, they said, well, Timmy Allen was the one who said, well, you need to put Melissa Morgan in that group. And I went to meet Petrus and, you know, he just put me in the group and paid me and we, we went to the studio and did high, um, uh, feeling lucky lately. So you touched on briefly about the, the session scene at the time. And something I'm really, really fascinated with is that is the, the session and club scene in New York around that time. Because it's like all of y'all singers were in one area. What was that like? Because it's like you, Jocelyn Brown, Lisa Fisher, just all of you guys in one area. You know what? It's... It seems like we would have been stepping on each other's toes, right? It seems like, 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 oh, I got to get this gig. Oh, she got the gig. Oh, gotta get this. But it wasn't like that. There was room for everybody for some reason. I, I, I don't know how the universe worked that out, but there was room for everyone. Jocelyn was really like the go-to. And, and like, um, the first time I did a session with Jocelyn Brown, she, she didn't like the way I sang. <laughs> <laughs> she and I said something, <laughs> and they was talking in the corner. I said, man, she's all right. I'm, like, I'm, just, I'm, I'm not feeling her, you know? So, uh, but I, I got through the session and then she wound up calling me again. I was like, oh, you just, you know, you're just the number one. So we have to treat you like you're number one and we're all beneath you. <laughs> so, uh, but she wound up calling me for a couple of more sessions. So that was just her way of saying that. I'm in charge. I, I, I'm the go-to girl, and then I get y'all. So, uh, but it, it was really wonderful, and I got to um, sing at the cellar with Johnny Camp and and all these wonderful people that were up and coming in the in the New York scene, and and uh, it was singing background with Kashif going on tour with him. He had signed with Arista, and I had did all his records singing background. And, me and Whitney had sang with him and all kinds of stuff. And it was uh, singing with him that I got the deal for Capitol Records because uh, his management, uh, we did something for Gladys Knight on Broadway. We opened for her and his management was there. And, and I came backstage and I said, hello. And they said, hello. They said, come in and talk to us, you know? And I came in, they was like, okay, so you've been singing background behind everyone. We know your story. Don't you think it's time for you to do your own thing? And uh, that was Hush Productions. I was like, yeah, I'd, I'd love to do my own thing. And I had sang with Shaka Khan by then, you know, background with her. And they told me, they said, come into the office tomorrow, because it was on a Sunday we did the show. And I came into the office the next day, and they signed me on the spot to Capitol Records. So yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned singing background for Shaka and Whitney, and I know you did, uh, who was it, Keep in Touch, Body to Body, and so you have this long resume of background session work. How, you as a singer, how were you able to turn off all of that background singing experience to craft your own sound on your for your debut and solo material? Let me see. Because when, when you're in a session, you have to blend. So, so it was important to blend. So I, I, I learned that skill. And then after Shaka Khan, because uh, I had idolized her so much and I had went and, and, you know, I was the one that had the Shaka posters all on the wall and and, uh, you know, just singing every affectation, every single note that she sang, the way she sang it. But I think it was some of the gospel experience that helped me with that, that even though I could blend in and, and sing with everyone, I still had my own sound. And that's what, what Kashif and, and Whitney and all of them called me for, that even though I blended in, it was the Melissa sound. And um, I, I don't know how it happened, but I think Conrad Washington um, uh, helped me with that because when I first uh, joined the gospel choir, she gave me a record to sing. And I went and I sang the record and I came back and I sang and she played piano and uh, uh, she went out the room and she came back in. She says, you are excellent. I can't, I can't wait to work with you, but now we have to pull out Melissa. 
you know, because you sound so much like the record. We have to find where Melissa is in there because you can duplicate, you know, anything. So I'm, I'm very good at duplicating, but somehow she taught me how to duplicate but still have my own sound. Yeah. So I, I can't let you go without telling that getting to know you better is <laughs> in, in my top five songs of yours. I love that song so much. <laughs> um, um, so like. So you have the hit, Do Me Baby, and uh, uh, will you, Do You Still Love Me, uh, Fool's Paradise. So you have all these hits. How involved were you in the production and arranging side of that? 100%. Yeah, mm -hmm. all the vocals were, were, and still to this day, even with Footprints of, the Angel, Footprints of an Angel, all the vocals are 100% uh, arranged by me. Not always uh, uh, written by me because uh, Footprints of an Angel, I have my fiance, uh, Sebastian uh, Thomas, who uh, he, he knows that young, younger, like, medley sound so you know he put his uh you know no don't sing it like this sing it like that you know what i'm saying so he puts that in but when it comes to like the backgrounds and how everything should go together i'm like 100 in that you know once you show me like that's what i need to do it's like okay well then if i need to do this then this needs to be here and that needs to be there and it was once again i i i, I talk about kashif a lot today it was kashif that taught me how to stack my vocals like i do I recently spoke to um, Mickey Howard and she mentioned I, that she's, she's so nice. <laughs> that's, my, that's one of my, my, my musical sisters. Yeah, I love her. <laughs> so, so I recently spoke to her um, and she mentioned that you guys are among a group of artists. You were among the first by major record labels pushing you guys to try and um, go pop. Did you ever feel that pressure as well? But I didn't feel the pressure. But what I what I did was try to deliver great songs. Mm -hmm. And uh, even with Doomy Baby, that was a print song. We can't go pop. I, I, I'm going to clarify that. We cannot go pop. They have to take us pop. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because we can't change the way we sing they can give us a different uh um track behind us they can give us different uh uh medleys to sing and how to sing it and all that stuff but we can't go pop it takes a great record and crossing it over and taking it pop and and, and that's that's what the the dilemma is i think for our singers is that we're, we're never going to you know because they say oh we want a pop song now we're going to start singing like this because we want to go pop no <laughs> we're always going to sing like this because this is what we do now they have to take that and make pop understand that you know what i'm saying this is what's going on right now so um i think Nicki minaj drake all of them that go pop they don't change their sound to go pop but the record company says okay we're going to take this pop and that becomes what happens yeah as r&b artist did y'all always have that label support to be taken pop no and that's what happened is that no because rb is is something that's one thing but to take rb and push it pop that's a whole nother dollar figure and so if they don't say we're going to take the that we believe in you enough that now you have a number one song that we're going to take that you know, over here and push it up just as much, it's not gonna happen. You know, Do Me Baby was the number one song uh, on R&B charts and really across the world for four weeks, but Capitol did not wanna spend that money to take it up. But then they got MC Hammer, you know, and they wanted to spend that money and that's what happened. Yeah, so it, they you have to want to take it up, you know? So is that sort of what happened with uh, remaining Capitol Records 
uh, albums? Well, yeah, uh, and, and also um, Inner Structure. Uh, uh, I got signed to Capitol with David Grayson, who believed in Melissa Morgan. And uh, he did everything that he could to make Melissa Morgan stuff happen. Then he left, and then there was another president, and then he left, and there was another president. So it, it, it once the, the infrastructure of, of how you got there starts changing, you know, unless you have those numbers and those figures at that time, you know, where they have to do what they need to do. Some of them say, oh, you know, well, she's not in, as important to me as Hart is, or like I said, MC Hammer or something. So we're going to drop her. Yeah. So uh, by the third uh, uh, record president in Capitol Records, he wanted to drop. He literally calls him, you know, oh, well, you know, we've done all we can do with you. So we're going to let you go. Thankfully, you know, uh, I have a great team and have a great manager and always have and always will. But when he said that, we said, okay, well, if you're going to let me go, you got to pay me. Da 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 da. You know what I'm saying? And I can I can live off of that for about five years. You know what I'm saying? That's how much money it was. And once he realized that, he was like, oh oh oh. Well, wait a minute. Now I was like, nah, no, wait a minute now, because now I don't want to be with Capital with you as the president because you don't believe in me. So it it happens like that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but luckily, you know, you will move on to uh, Pendulum, I believe it was. And yeah. you gave us one of the greatest covers of all time, Still in Love. Yeah. A hit that sticks like grits. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's not hope it's the grits that, that, that was thrown <laughs> on Al Green. <laughs> oh, I just realized that. <laughs> I love y'all agree, but I'm going to like this. So. <laughs> but yeah, so you have another number one hit. Was there any interest of you, you know, on your behalf or even the label to like even try that lane of music even more? Um, the Pendulum was 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 a, a, a new label, and uh, may he rest in peace, uh, Ruben Rodriguez. He 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 wanted an R&B soul singer. He, we were all surprised when um, um, uh, Louis Vega and them took that uh, uh, song to uh, to number one on the dance shots. We were all surprised at, at how they did that. It was just really, really awesome because it shot up the um, the dance charts quicker than it did the R and B charts. Yeah, so we were we were really surprised. Until this day, it is just that song. When that song comes in, I we we've seen people transform into. It was like, well, wait a minute, you was just a nice person standing in the window that's still in love, coming they vote. You know, so it's like, oh, that's what's all up inside there. Okay. <laughs> so I'm I'm really thankful for that club hit. Yeah. <laughs> and so in the midst of all your success at this time, uh, you went to Juilliard. So can you tell us a little bit about what you did there? Um, um, I went to Juilliard to study music uh, theory. I was I was singing and and um, doing all these sessions and stuff like that. And I think I got into a session and, and um, it was something that they told me to sing. And it was like, why am I singing this and not singing that? And and uh, it was like because this this goes. And I was like, but doesn't this go? And, no, that 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 doesn't go. This goes. You know, if you sing this note, that goes. If you sing that note, it is just doesn't go. So um, I went to Julia's to learn music theory to find out why notes go with each other. So uh, and, it, it, and it was a great experience. And I actually to get in, I sang um, Natalie Cole's Inseparable because you have to audition. And I sang that and I got in. Yeah, and uh, I studied music theory for like, uh, gosh, almost three years, almost three years. And I actually left there because uh, that's when I got the call to sing uh, background behind Shaka Khan. And I said, well, I can stay here and continue to learn, or I can go on the road and learn from my idol, who will become my teacher. And uh, I talked to my dad, he was like, experience is the best teacher. So 
I went out on, I left Juilliard to go out on the road with Shaka Khan. So that, how much has that theory helped you and how you view music um, now? I have basically a uh, um, um, relative perfect pitch. Yeah, yeah. So I rarely ever, ever sing a bad note because I know in here. So it registers in here quicker. Like, okay, no, you can't do that. No, gotta do, you know what I'm saying? So I, I basically, when I go in the studio and, and I sing all my backgrounds and everything like that, I have relative perfect pitch. Yeah. I think after Pendulum, correct me if I'm wrong, there's like a, your next album wouldn't come for a little over a decade. Yeah, I'm that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah. I'm assuming okay. in that yeah. interim of time, um, you've begun. Did you begin managing yourself? Yes. 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 Because um, I actually, um, when my dad died, I think in '94. When my dad died, I fired everyone. Yeah, the managers that I had and everything, I fired everyone and just. Uh, started managing myself. I don't know, his spirit just just told me that I could do it, I could do it on my own because they wasn't doing what I needed. And I'm the type of person, I love singing. I love, love what I do. And I will go on the road and I will sing it. And I had such a, a slew of hits that, you know, basically I could go on the road and tour forever if I wanted to. But the one thing that I will not do is going to, into the studio and sing a song that I don't believe in. If that takes 10 or 20 years, whatever it takes, I will never, ever, ever go into the studio and sing a song that I don't believe in. So that's what that interim was, you know? Um, so I, I got married and that did work and, and uh, moved and bought condos and, and uh, my house here, my my, my uh, family left this to me and I renovated the whole thing in, in South Carolina. And uh, so I, I just toured and I work with people. I work with Najee. I, I did a song with him. I work with Full Force and um, Isaac Hayes. I did stuff with them and uh, uh, Shell Pepsi Raleigh. We recorded a duet. So I was doing little things until I, you know, decided to do another album. Yeah. What has that experience been like for you? Because I, I if I'm correct me if I'm wrong again, but I believe Footprints of an Angel is the first release on under your label, your management company. Yes, yes. <laughs> it was scary. It was scary. Uh, see, all these things is what kept me alive because. I wrote on this one, <laughs> Jay-Z. I wrote on this one, Mary J. Blige. I wrote on this one here, LL Cool J. Um, and people sample my music and I, I get nice royalty checks. So it's it's been a blessing that I could live my life even all through the pandemic. I, I, I laugh with people because I said, I'm probably one of the few artists that uh, collected unemployment because I paid my taxes. <laughs> But yes, I did. I got unemployment. I did during the pandemic and loved it. <laughs> loved it. Everything. Thank you. <laughs> but, uh, you know, now it's royalties and all that. And, and it, people don't even understand um, uh, when you make that decision to uh, manage yourself, uh, especially as a female, the industry, you know, is kind of like, oh, let's see what she's going to do. She needs somebody else to manage her until they see things start happening for you. And so this is this is one of those things that's happening for me that it's like, you know, oh, you made the right decision after all, huh? You know, so we're, we're very thankful for that. And uh, I don't know if people know about the, the music industry. It, it could take years before you really, really see money. So I'm, I'm really now seeing artist money from capital. It's it's the weirdest thing 20, 30 years later. Wow. Being, you know, I mean, good money, you know, in the tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of dollars, you start seeing if you do everything right in the beginning, 
You know what I'm saying? So I would tell anyone that's listening, new artists, make sure your paperwork and everything is right in the beginning because you might not see it in the beginning. You might not see it for 10 years, but 20, 30 years later, when it finally kicks in after you've paid everything back and done what you needed to do, it'll kick in and, and you'll be smiling like I am. <laughs> And you'll, 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 you'll release your own record on your own uh, label. And this is my fiance who told me, because we were going to go back with uh, Cleopatra or somebody to, to release with Prince of an Angel. And it was um, my fiance and, and a young lady named Deidre Tate that I have a lot of respect for, who said, you can release that on your own label, Melissa. It, it's time. So um, I did it. And we're, we're very happy. We just got added to... Um, Kirk Franklin's Serious Praise uh, channel, and um, gosh, we, Music Choice, and like you said, we're climbing up the charts, and uh, it's only been like three three weeks or so, so we're very, very happy with, with the progress, yes. Okay. I just want to let the viewers know that Melissa is all about her coins, and I'm waiting for you to bring <laughs> Melissa's fruit sticks <laughs> to one of your events, one of your shows. <laughs> And, oh, and your crochets. I will, I will. You know what? I just did a beautiful, beautiful. First, last week, which was Mother's Day, I'm, I'm hooked up with a restaurant here called Deshaun's. And Deshaun's is um, Deanna Brown, who is James Brown's daughter. And her husband's restaurant here in, in, in the South Carolina uh, Augusta, Georgia area. And they hired me for Valentine's and for uh, Mother's Day to bring my fruit sticks to the restaurant. I think they want a little celebrity there too. I don't know about them. I love them. They're like family. So, you know, I, I bring it to them. They sell a little bit, but then on the day I come in and, you know, you want some fruit sticks, Melissa, sign, take pictures, all that stuff. So that was fun. But then Deanna is going to be a grandmother and she had a wonderful baby shower for the mother to be for her son's uh, fiance. And they let me do my fruit sticks. And oh God, it was just, I'm going to post a picture because we did the baby's name in, in cantaloupe. It was, I mean, in, in uh, watermelon. So it was so beautiful. And then all the chocolate covered strawberries and the fruit. And oh, they ate it all. They ate it all. It was great. So hopefully I'll do that. So now my crochet and it takes longer. My best friend is still waiting for me to finish her blanket from when we were a teenager. <laughs> and I do everybody else's blanket but hers. I don't know why. So I got to finish Darlene's blanket. Yeah. <laughs> So last two questions, the first uh -huh. being, after all these years in the game, how yeah. is the voice still intact? Everything is still in the original key. All the notes are there. What have you done? Well, I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do drugs. And I sleep. Yeah. I sleep. I'll tell you. I, I, I can hibernate like a bear. <laughs> I think if, if, if sometimes, you know, we travel from New York to here, you know, because I have my condo in New York, we travel here and it's like 16 hours. And when I get here, I can literally sleep for like two weeks and not even see anyone. Yeah. Yeah. So I just taking care of myself. I go to the doctor during the pandemic. I had high blood pressure. So I had to reel it in because we was eating ice cream and shrimp every day. And uh, the doctor was like, you, you got to watch all that because you got cholesterol and all that. So they were like, we know that it's not you. It's just the, uh, the stress of everything with the, uh, the pandemic. Two years of, of uh, this pandemic has been really stressful. But we had to get back to exercise and take care of ourselves, eat fruit you know, take out black seed oil and do all the things that we need to do. So we're in much better shape. I just see my doctor and she says, I'm doing great. So. Uh, and to wrap up, is Footprints of an Angel the sign of something bigger to come? Yes. Yes. Uh, I, like I told you, um, it's, it's part of a movie. So the movie will be out in the summer of uh, this year, 2022. And uh, Footprints is the theme song. So when you see the trailer, it's going to be playing all over everywhere. And uh, after that, uh, I think the song that I sang in the movie 
the gospel song is going to be released because uh, uh, that's only I propose to do that. And then we're probably going to be working in the meantime on an EP. I will do an EP because it's on my label. And I don't want to do 10, 12 songs. So we will do an EP and release a couple of more singles and then uh, release the EP. And uh, we're excited about that because uh, I'm setting up my own studio. Yes. <laughs> so we're going to have everything here. My mic and studio, my fiance is going to be working his magic. And uh, we're looking forward to it. All right. So any final words for the viewers before we go? Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, my the Footprints of the Angels, the video, which we did. Um, uh, it's up to like almost 25,000. Uh, K views, um, uh, the Vivo one and the one on my channel. So please follow me on YouTube and subscribe and uh, leave a comment and follow me on um, all my social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, all that good stuff. It's just Melissa, M-E-L-I-S-A, M-O-R-G-A-N Morgan. There might be a two or something behind it, but if you put in M-E-L-I-S-A, M-O-R-G-A-N, no two L's, no two S's, no nothing, one of everything, you'll find me. You'll see this hair. <laughs> you'll see the bitch come up. <laughs> well, all right. So thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you. It's so much fun. Thank you.